Welcome back to a slideshow for Victory Garden. This is continuing the winter of 2010-2011, and we're picking up where I left off, which is February 2nd, 2011. We won't be having quite as many pictures today, so hopefully we'll be clocking in right around 30 minutes. This first picture is going to be showing you another Type 1 error that I committed, and hopefully you will be able to learn from my mistakes. Let's get this loaded here. If this computer will play along. Here it goes. Okay, well, in this picture you can see a type 1 error. As I just said, a type 1 error in permaculture is an error that should never occur. This is These are errors that occur through a lack of knowledge, a lack of design, a lack of forethought, and generally are disasters, or as Subholzer might call them, catastrophes. Uh, this would be a catastrophe. It, it was a small-scale catastrophe on our own property, of our own making. These are the type of things that permaculture attempts to avoid. Uh, permaculture attempts to repair if they are present on your property when you... Uh, when you start doing permaculture there, these are things that you don't actually do in permaculture. But I did this, and I'm showing it to you. Um, I think quite often on the internet here, we attempt to put on a really big smiley face and say, Oh, permaculture, once you do it, you don't make any mistakes, and everything goes just swimmingly, and it's just so goddamn awesome that anybody could do it. Well... This is what happens when just anybody gets a shovel and starts doing things. Uh, there's some background on it. This is what I termed a overflow trench system for my swales. My swales were filling up and they were staying full. They were not draining our soil again, being so compacted. It didn't really have anywhere to go. And so with all that water hanging out there, I was afraid that with another storm, we would be seeing some kind of failure of the berms. Uh, we might see water overflowing and just uh, going God knows where, although I guess if I had sat down and thought about it, I would have been able to figure out where the water was going and come out with a better solution. This is not the solution to very full swales. This is creating a gully. Whenever you're working with water, as I know now, you never have water run in a straight line for very long. Having water run in a straight line allows it to gain speed, and as it gains speed, you're increasing the erosion. As you might know, water is actually the most destructive force on Earth. It moves more land, it destroys more human activities, it does more damage than almost anything else that we know of. Uh, and, you know, for something that most of us consider to be so benign, I guess that's why we have this naive approach to, well, I'll just move it from A to B as fast as possible. No, 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 and no. So what I did by digging a straight line from the two swales connecting each other and from the second swale to the pond, which is, yeah, this is an entrance channel here at the bottom to the first pond, is I created an earth-moving gully. Uh, look at the color of that water that's just full of clay. So I am silting up a pond that I just spent hours digging. I'm silting up swales that I just spent time digging. Uh, just error compounded upon error and I didn't actually fix these until I believe it was this last winter. So 2011 to 2012 was when I uh, finally admitted that I completely screwed this up. Uh, and I've been trying to repair it since then, and I've been doing a pretty good job. But I won't dwell on this too much, but I do, again, I, I love showing you my errors because maybe you'll laugh a little bit. Maybe you'll just be able to see that, look, maybe I'm not the only one who makes these mistakes, and we should share them with one another. Um, I did have some other ideas for this uh, as time went on, but I'll show you that as we get to them. Uh, and we, like I said, we won't have too many pictures from uh, February through the beginning of March. But we're going to move to the next day. So this is the third. This is indoors. This is up in my room. Uh, it's upstairs, south-facing window. So we were able to start some plants inside and keep them warm. I just thought this was a fairly uh, pretty picture with the light coming in through the blinds and the herbs reaching up towards the sun. These cells, I hoped, my hope was that by building cells out of cardboard, 
that when the time came to transplant, I could remove the cardboard and have these semi-root-bound, um, you, know, you don't really want plants to be root-bound, but you know what I'm saying, having a root mass to pull out of the trays, and they wouldn't be quite as entangled with one, on it, with one another. Uh, didn't <laughs> didn't work out that way, but it was, it was a thought at least. So uh, moving on to the next picture, this is on the 8th, so five days later, uh, we decided we should start the winter stratification for our cardinal flowers and our great blue lobelias. These are uh, water-loving plants. They're more of a, a bog plant than they are a marginal or definitely an aquatic plant, but they, they like a lot of water and they also provide a lot of nectar and they're just a really beautiful native. Both of them are. So in order to get them to germ you need to put them through a false winter or you can sow them outside if you have enough seed but with the seed company we went with initially they gave us uh, just a, a pittance we, we we wouldn't order from them again just they charge you way too much and you, you don't get anything for your money in my opinion uh, but you know we ordered from them and get your soil wet put it into some containers, uh, you sprinkle the seed on top, these don't really get covered but I just put a tiny bit more soil on top of them to hold them down um, and put them into trays and if you're smart enough you'll poke some holes in the bottom of these containers and that way you can bottom water them, keep them moist and the reason why they're all taped up and back into almost a greenhouse is that I, I just don't want other types of seeds to move in, I don't want critters to get into them so easily and then once we had patched these up we put them outdoors in full shade 24 7 no sunlight because we don't want them heating up we just want them to stay cool and moist uh, until spring rolls around and then you can put them out into the sun and then you know they'll start to germ moving on to the ninth the next day our Endomycorrhizal inoculant arrived from Bioorganics. Bio uh, this is uh, one and a half pounds, 680 grams of fungi spores. And these are going to colonize our plants, most of our plants. Most of our plants will be using endomycorrhizal fungi. With the degraded condition of our soils, we figured that it would be a really good idea to start the colonization uh, almost artificially rather than attempting to just wait and see. Um, as I mentioned in the first slideshow, our soil is very low in nutrition, low in organic matter, and therefore very to not tolerant but prone to uh, uh, or susceptible to uh, drought conditions, susceptible to all the things that come from a degraded soil. and after reading edible forest gardens, reading online, you just discover this wonderful world of fungi uh, and all the wonderful things they can do for you. And if you read the uh, the packaging here, you know it's uh, it's not. This isn't like a one one thing fixes all your problems, uh, but you know many benefits may result. And they say may result, I guess, so you don't sue them. But they may result from use of this inoculant, including increased nutrient uptake, enhanced tolerance of various environmental stresses, such as drought and soil salinity. So they are going to help colonize our poor soil. They're going to help out our uh, yeah, sacrificial lambs of the plants that we're going to put in this year and uh, begin setting up a living network within the soil, structuring it, finding water and nutrients, and doing all the things that mycorrhizal fungi do. So let's move on to the next picture. You can see here that we're beginning to perform our double digging. I wanted to double dig from the top of the slope down. Uh, not sure exactly why, but you can see that I've put compost piles there irregularly. Those compost piles are sitting on top of the double dug beds. We didn't have a lot of mulch. I, didn't, I don't have any mulch yet. Uh, so in order to protect these beds from further compaction and from the environmental stressors, put on a layer of compost, and this compost is going to leach nutrients and even a little bit of organisms down into this newly loosened soil. Um, 
I guess one of the reasons why I decided to double dig from the top down uh, was that it's a lot easier to move compost down a hill than truck it up a hill. So just bring it uphill once and then just flip it down continuously. You can see two bags of something here. Uh, right along the bottom right portion of the screen, the plastic bag there is full of coffee grounds and the green bag to the right of it is lime. So we were working in lime into the top section of these double dug beds. This so next picture here is showing you those compost piles and the pathways again. Uh, in order to protect the pathways, put down some cardboard. Uh, you're going to get, with this type of clay, you're going to be getting a lot of clay onto your shoes and tr checking it around. And then I like to work barefoot when it's warm outside and I just don't like having clay all in clods all over the place. It's just one of those things I, I'm still kind of tidy about. I don't like seeing soil just sitting out. Next photograph here, I'm showing you the double digging process or at least the beginning stages of it. Don't mind the truck outside. Okay, it's passed. So you can see that I've stripped off the grass and the stripped off topsoil, that grass, I put onto the mounds that I was building in the last slideshow and it obviously continuing on here. And digging the first trench, you dig a trench, take that first section of soil, set it aside either into a wheelbarrow or onto a tarp like I'm doing here, and then you loosen the soil underneath that. Then you move one shovel length to the next side next to it, and then you move that topsoil, put it on top uh, of the newly loosened trench, and in that process you're also breaking up the soil, and then you loosen another section. So we were loosening and loosening. It takes quite a bit of work considering the compaction that we were dealing with, and you would maybe you'd be amazed at how compacted the soil was. Uh, of course, clay has got the tiniest particle size. Uh, so once you loosen it, a, a double dug bed is going to be about three or four inches above the non-compacted soil, and it's really loose. So you can just you can take a stick and you can put it down two and a half feet or so into the ground and. Uh, you know, that's going to be a much better growing condition for your new plants. Uh, it is a form of tilling. It is a form of tilling. Permaculture, people don't till quite as often. It's not it's something that we try to tell people not to do. But it's not something you never do. This is something that uh, is a site repair. We, we, we would be waiting years for a cover crop of daikon radishes, of clovers, of alfalfa, whatever polyculture of soil builders we put in, it would take years to loosen the soil to the point where anything could grow to any extent. And so having lots of energy, being young, get out there and uh, you know put the sweat equity into at least part of the garden so we could have something productive. Uh, once a bed was double dug, uh, we would till in or just fork in garden lime because our soil pH came back very low, mostly in the fours, so like a 4.2, a 4.5. Unless we were just planting a boatload of blueberries, your plants aren't going to grow very well unless you get some lime in there. And again, lime is a, a quick way to boost your soil pH, but the best thing to do is add organic matter, which we were doing with our cover crops later on. Next picture here, seeing just the extent of how, look at how many plants we were starting in size, quite a bit of plants, uh, everything from tomatoes and peppers and basil, oregano, hyssop, uh, everything that we wanted to transplant out into the garden, uh, sort of a conventional way, uh, we did. I wouldn't really do this again, uh, maybe with peppers, some other plants, but tomatoes in our climate don't need to be started inside. Uh, moving to next day, we're going to go from the 9th to the 18th, so nine days later. Uh, just going to show you a picture of some of what most people call weeds. This is henbit, uh, some other species in here as well, but uh, just showing you that I'm beginning to take a look at what's growing on the property, what is already here, uh, what you know, what is it doing, where does it grow, how long does it live, asking these kind of questions. and. Most of the time trying to figure out what it was. Sometimes I just didn't bother because I was double digging. I spent 
months and months double digging as you'll see as the slideshow goes on. And now 10 days later, 10 days later, uh, remember I have a full-time job while I'm doing this. Uh, so I'm working full-time, eight hours a day, and in the meantime, if I'm home, whenever I'm home, if I'm not eating something, I'm outside double digging. You can see that now we've progressed down over almost to the first swale uh, from the north, sorry, the south side of the garden, and different paths, different uh, bed shapes taking place, and as the compost moved down uh, and as the city uh, began to offer up mulch and compost, we would be trucking some of that in and I would patch up the places where we didn't have enough compost anymore. So never want to leave soil exposed. Uh, you know, I would have to take a break sometimes from double digging because we just didn't have enough organic matter to uh, protect this soil. When you, when you spend uh, four hours double digging a small section, you, you become really protective of it. Um, you can see just how many stones I'm pulling out, and it's, it's a lot of effort to get this going. Next picture here, now you can see the first swale and the second swale, and you can see where I'm going to be double digging next. You can see that I've played around with the uh, pine, pine straw in order to come up with the most growing area. Uh, laying out your pathways, you, you have to have pathways in a small area like this. I personally don't care what anyone else says. You, I'm just walk anywhere. No, you know, I'm double digging. I'm trying to get the soil loose and humans walking around stomping on everything is just an absolutely terrible idea uh, in order to, you're, you're just increasing compaction and you're wasting your work. Um, I've already done that by digging that <laughs> that irrigation channel and everything. I've, I've managed to uh, make more work for myself more than once, but it, there is one place where I definitely did not screw up, and that was by making sure we had permanent pathways. Now, there is one thing wrong with the pathways. I'm not going to say that these are the best pathways, the most efficient system here, but these pathways, I didn't make them wide enough. Uh, at least the main arteries really should be at least a yard or a meter uh, wide and that's to facilitate the use of a wheelbarrow uh, in order to have the turnaround points and everything. You can see actually there's a big circle, a, semi, a big circle of pine straw and that's wide enough to do a complete turn with a wheelbarrow but the thing is the pathways leading to that wheelbarrow turnaround are so narrow that you'll end up running into plants later on and Remember from the last slideshow, I told you this is the first garden I ever did. This is the first time I've ever done permaculture, so I'm making quite a bit of mistakes. But again, make mistakes and learn from them and share them. Please share your mistakes. Um, something else in this picture, you can see the mulched areas on both of the swales. Uh, the mulched areas, the black area, that's where I planted some comfrey and you'll see some close-up pictures of those but this is a good time to tell you that I put comfrey on the swales because they're a dynamic accumulator and they're a dynamic accumulator that produces so much and they grow so fast they need a lot of water and not only do they need a lot of water but if you want them to really work for you uh, you should put them in the way of water you should put them where your nutrients are running off to create nets I like calling them nets they're my um, how do you want to call them like fertility building their fertility building workhorses they they produce exactly what we need at this stage of a forest garden well we need to produce biomass as fast as possible and so by having these two lines these two crops of comfrey that are going to be you know just pumping out the biomass for us we're setting ourselves up for a much more positive future. Uh, we planted comfrey in a lot more locations, and you know, I'm telling you, there's these lines of comfrey. But we only had so many roots that we bought. We only bought, I think, about 20 roots. Uh, so we need to get them established, get them going, see, you know, plant them in some different locations. You'll see uh, that as as time goes on. 
Uh, and you know, of course, later we can always dig them up and spread the roots. And that's what I did in the spring of 2012. I managed to uh, plant out both of these swales are now almost entirely lined with comfrey. And so we are uh, well on our way to restoring fertility. Move on to another picture here. Uh, now we're looking north uh, from the double dog, double dog area. Uh, just again, another perspective of it showing you these beds are small. You know, these beds in order, I'm, I'm about six feet tall. And if I'm bending over and I want to be able to reach into the center of the beds, they really can't be that, uh, that wide unless we wanted to have wide beds with uh, almost tertiary paths, tertiary paths, paths that you're not going to use quite as often, or stepping stones, those type of things. Uh, but my parents, my father's a little bit taller than I am, but my mother, she's, she's shorter, so we couldn't make these beds too big, otherwise they would just be inaccessible. You have to think about uh, who's going to be using this garden and, and uh, just what size uh, you know, beds they can manage. Moving on to another picture, here's a little bit closer of those comfrey plants. Sheet mulched, uh, they're emerging already in, uh, in February, I believe. That's just absolutely amazing that at the end of February, just two weeks later, in our climate, we can have comfrey cuttings emerge. That's how warm, that's how mild our winters are. And that's, again, a testament to the strength of comfrey. Comfrey is just a phenomenal plant. Uh, even closer, here's here it is. It's uh, jutting out, putting out its first leaves. Um, I found that comfrey is indomitable. I mean, it, it's one of these plants that you can't. It, nothing's going to overcome comfrey. Uh, let's put it that way. I've had a comfrey plant die. It, for some reason, it just rotted down to its crown, and I just. I noticed it and took away all those rotted leaves and hoped, hoped that it would come back, and it came back. Uh, comfrey is, like I said, you can't kill comfrey unless you can kill all the roots, which is really tough, almost impossible. You're not going to do it. This next picture, again, showing you a little polyculture of uh, weeds that are existing on the property. These are doing their thing, again, with the weeds. Let them display their qualities for you. Most of us have grown up calling them weeds. We're, we haven't called them a hen bit, uh, you know, chickweed, uh, stinging, not stinging nettles here, but dead nettles, uh, wh whatever. We've grown up stigmatizing them to the point where we don't understand their qualities and characteristics. Uh, there are some plants that are, they are weedy. There are some plants that just will take over a garden. Um, but again, they're growing in places you haven't imagined to put seed so let them show you what they're capable of and then decide for yourself whether or not you want them on your property. Uh, unless, you know, it's like poison ivy. That's something nobody wants on their property. Moving on, here's another little net that we set up for some comfrey. We've put comfrey all around the property where water is rushing away and we need to slow it down and we need to capture those nutrients. Some close-up of some trees that are... Uh, beginning to flower outside of our property. I just thought these were interesting. I never looked closely. They, they're so alien looking. They're, they're very beautiful. Uh, these are my neighbor's property. Uh, so is this one. This is just, just uh, otherworldly um, and beautiful. So take a look around your, your neighborhood. Walk. You know, get outside of your garden. See what's happening around. Uh, you know, try to figure out what type of trees they are. But if you don't, you know, don't worry about it quite as much. Uh, you know, pay attention to your own business sometimes. Uh, but at the same time, you do need to be aware of what's flowering when. And so you have an idea of where some plants might blow in from, what type of plants, what, you know, trees or, uh, you know, shrubs or whatever. And trying to figure out where other habitats are that are within a, a reasonable distance of your property so you can kind of guess at what kind of critters and everything might come around and we're going to end this slideshow with another picture of water this is just a photograph uh, after a good rain and of course I have that absolutely stupid um, overflow trench that has 
sent water running down, so this is actually running off quicker than it should, but still a lot less than it would before we did our swales and everything. And you can see just how that berm channels water between those two birch trees and sends it out of the property. Uh, it's it's uh, nice working with a slope. Um, unfortunately, the way the water goes, it's sort of our main pathway to get down to the basement. And so we, we're trying to come up with a solution, a workable solution to, uh, you know, harness that water but still have a pathway for us to walk. We may end up doing a boardwalk. But that is, that's it for uh, the winter of 2010 to 2011. Uh, this picture was uh, March 11th, actually. So March 11th is when I kind of said, okay, that's that's the end of winter. And I hope you've learned a little bit, seen uh, what was going on in our winter. And if you have any questions, just let me know.